Well, what a wonderful day to be alive in Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm so glad to be here today, and I, I really appreciate uh, Pastor Kent and Liz uh, sharing the pulpit with me and allowing me to share with you. This is uh, just, it's good every time I come just to the feel, the, the presence of God and the fellowship and the love and the people that greeted me. It's just a delightful church, and I am so very glad that uh, we in Bon Terre are part of the same family. Uh, it, it's just great every time they come. And, you know, every other week it, we see uh, the pastors on the screen. And, you know, the transition is always just real sweet and good. And it's been delightful. It's just been a great experience. And I think it's wonderful. Hallelujah, indeed. Well, let's pray. Father, we bless you today and praise you. We magnify your name. You're awesome and wonderful and glorious and kind and outstanding and more words than we can even put together. We thank you for this day and we thank you for this word that's about to come forth. Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak to our hearts and that you would drop in some tidbits to each and every one that they would receive today something for their life today. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I want to start today in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. If I can get over there, I've even got it marked. There it is. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, and I think that's going to be on the screen. But uh, I like to read from the pages of the Bible. I'm old-fashioned that way. Uh, I do have a... The, the Bibles on my laptop, on my iPad, and on my telephone. But uh, there's nothing like the pages and nothing like the feeling of just the Bible. And, of course, you know, when I started out, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers. We didn't have uh, iPads. And uh, so technology is wonderful and it's great. My first computer I purchased in order to put a Bible program on to study. And uh, that was back in the 90s. So, uh, and it, it's just been a, a still a good, uh, I've still got that same original program. And I use it often, and, and it's really great. Uh, but in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And of course, that's Jesus. So the title of my sermon today is In the Name of Jesus. Now, when we pray, often uh, most people say when they finish, get the end of the prayer, in the name of Jesus, or sometimes in your name or other things like that. And uh, I wonder if sometimes it's just kind of something we add and aren't really, because we have done it so much and so long, that uh, it just becomes automatic. Um, and, and I want to challenge us that the next time you pray and you're going to say, in the name of Jesus, that you just pause for a moment and say, in the name of Jesus, and think about him and how great and wonderful he is. And uh, today I want to tell you uh, how great he is. And I know that you already know that. And uh, I know that you know a whole lot of what I'm going to say. So this is going to be a review. But uh, I believe it'll be helpful. Jesus is the transliteration of Joshua, meaning Jehovah is salvation. In other words, Savior. So we like that because Jesus is our Savior. Christ means anointed. Jesus, the Christ, occurs twice in the New Testament. Savior means Savior, Deliverer, Preserver, and it occurs 24 times in the New Testament. Now what that means is, no matter what you have need of, body, soul, spirit, emotions, whatever, Savior covers it all. It's not just saving me from my sins and I'm going to heaven, but it's for my whole being. Jesus takes it all. Jesus has it all. Jesus gives it all. And uh, he has provided for us in that way. From Matthew to John, Jesus occurs 700 times. 
That was shocking to me. I've read the Bible many, many times. But during the preparation for this message, I discovered that. From Matthew to Revelation, Jesus Christ occurs 192 times. Lord occurs over 500 times in the New Testament. How many of you knew that? Isn't that an amazing thing? Lord Jesus Christ, 86 times. Son of God, 45 times. Son of David, 16 times. Son of Man, 92 times. And all but three of those, Jesus was speaking about Himself. He was relating to man. He called Himself Son of Man because He came to earth to relate to us, to relate to us on a human level and then a spiritual level too. Now there's some other names of Jesus. Our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Christ, our Savior. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Christ Jesus, the Lord. Here's the good one. Christ Jesus, my Lord. So just say that, will you? Christ Jesus, my Lord. Or if you said Jesus Christ, my Lord, that's all right too. Christ is found in Acts through Revelation, but not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But in Matthew 123 is one of my favorite names of Jesus. And that is Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Oh, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, or if you're depending on the screen, that's all right too. Acts chapter 3, and I want to read verses 1 through 8. I still hear the pages. Oh, that sounds good. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been unable to walk from birth was being carried, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order for him to beg for charitable gifts from those entering the temple grounds. Now, a little further over in chapter 4, we find out he was over 40 years old. So he had been carried to the temple for a long time, many, many times. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple grounds, he began asking to receive charitable gifts. But Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, Look at us. And he gave them atten his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not have silver and gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And grasping him, him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones were strengthened. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Can you imagine that? First of all, that he was healed. That's a miracle after all those years. But the second thing was he didn't have to learn to walk. How many of you had to learn to walk? How many of you stumbled around a little, crawled around? And the other thing about that, the faith of Peter to reach out to him, grab him by the hand to help him up. But once he helped him up, he didn't need any more help because the Lord Jesus had healed him. Another thing I find fascinating about that is he didn't go over to the beggar and lay hands on him and pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ that you would heal this man. He didn't pray to ask him to be healed, but he spoke in the name of Jesus for him to be healed. And he was healed. And of course, maybe some of you have experienced that too. Uh, on the way here this morning, I was having some stomach problems, hurting right in here. And uh, that went on for a little while until I remembered what I was going to speak on today. 
And so I prayed, and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, spirit of infirmity, to get away from me, leave me alone. I belong to Jesus. This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have no right here. Get out of here in the name of Jesus Christ. And guess what? The word was true. And it happened. And so I asked and I commanded. My wife and I years ago discovered that if all of a sudden you start feeling bad, it may be a spirit of infirmity. And so we would immediately pray and command it to get away and leave us alone. And of course it did. Now poor old Peter, you know, here's this miracle happening, but the Jewish leaders weren't real happy about it. And so they saw what was going on. Of course, the religious leaders were jealous of the Christians because of the things that were happening that weren't happening in their area. They had a religion, but they didn't have a relationship. They had religion, but they didn't have miracles because they didn't know the miracle worker. Although in their history, they knew about the miracles that God did to get them out of Egypt and into the promised land. Yet it wasn't personal to them. So the Jewish leaders, the high priests, and all of the high priestly uh, descent, in other words, all the big guys, came out and said, by what power or in what name have you done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Ah, oh, can you imagine? Remember, Peter's the one that denied knowing Jesus to the servant girl. And now here he is speaking to all the religious leaders and saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. Boldness. Well, they thought about this, and they commanded him not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. So they recognized there was some power there that was related to the name of Jesus. And we command you, don't speak anymore in that name. However, Peter and the disciples, as we can't help but speak of what we have seen and heard. And so then they went out. They spoke in the name of Jesus. They preached and they taught and did whatever. Well, don't you know the Jewish council called them in again and set them down and said, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And here you are spreading this all around. And so they really wanted to be harsh and, and uh, wanted, probably wanted to kill Peter and the other disciple, whoever was there with him. But there was a guy named Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was... a uh, um, well, they call him a lawyer, but what that meant, he was a teacher of the law. In fact, when you read a little further, you find out that Paul sat under his teaching. But anyhow, Gamaliel says, hey, guys, wait a minute. Be careful what you do with these guys, because if this is from God, you're going to find yourself fighting against God. And if it's from man, it's just going to fade out anyhow. So careful what you do. Well, apparently they didn't believe what he said because they flogged him, beat him, and sent him out of there. And they left rejoicing that they considered worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. And they did not stop teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one. Hallelujah. Now let's turn to Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. And this is one of Paul's prayers. Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. And here's the prayer. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the boundless greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come." and put all things in subjection under his feet, and made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So here we are. Paul is praying that we would understand just who Jesus is, just 
the how high above everything else. His name is the name above all names. And he has a power and authority. And he's the guy who's head of the church. And he's the guy who's head of me. And he's the guy who's head of you. So in his prayer, he was praying a number of things. And I want to review those. Inheritance in the saints. And remember, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. What an inheritance. And in verse 19, it was power toward usward, the strength of his might, not our might, his might. Raised him up, that's Jesus, from the dead, and seated him at his right hand. Now, although Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father, when Stephen was stoned, what happened? Stephen looked up and saw Jesus standing. Can you imagine that? Jesus standing to see what was happening to one of his. And then far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name, and all things in subjection, head over all things to the church, and he fills all in all. Name above every name. That's Jesus. That's the Jesus that we teach the children in, in, little, in Sunday school or children's church about how great He is and He's being your Savior and He wants to be your Savior and your friend. Jesus, head of the church. Jesus was under the authority of His Father. For He said in, in John, I do nothing on my own initiative. He also said, I always do the things that please Him, the Father. The works that I do in my Father's name. And then in John 5, 27, the Father gave Jesus this authority. Authority was passed on from the Father to the Son to the saints. That's down to us. Authority that we have. Because He wants us to be victorious Christians not only in our own lives, but sharing with others and helping others to get set free. The things that we have learned, the things that we've experienced to pass on, to help others. Remember Matthew 28, 18 to 20? All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore. So he was passing it on. And then another verse, Matthew 12, 21 says... In his names, the Gentiles will hope. Not just the Jews. It's to us too. The wall of partition is torn down. We have, we have the ability to go into the Holy of Holies and speak to the Lord and hear from the Lord. And by the way, wasn't worship wonderful this morning? Thank you, worship team. Oh, how great. Just... And I sit, I sit down part of the time. Uh, I needed to, to make sure my legs were good for standing. And I like to close my eyes and raise my hands. But since I've been having ear trouble, I have to hold on to something. So you may, if some of you may have seen me, I'm holding on to a chair or whatever. But uh, because I guess that's middle ear. But anyhow, worshiping the Lord and the sweetness of it, and, and the participation. I'm so thrilled to see that you folks are a worshiping church. And you know, we have a small congregation, but we worship too. Yes. And it's just really sweet. Glory to God. Acts 8, 12, we're not going to turn there, but Philip was preaching the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. That's important. The kingdom of God, under His authority, and the name of Jesus Christ, the authority that's given us to act on his behalf. Paul also preached the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Re remember Revelation 17, 14? Jesus is the Lord of lords and King of kings. There's nobody above him except the Father. Lord of lords and King of kings. We must be under authority to have authority. If you're not under authority, you don't have any authority. And uh, there are biblical examples of delegated power. One of those is in Genesis. 
Remember Joseph? He interpreted the dream for Pharaoh and said there's going to be seven years of famine, so what we need to do is set aside and store houses to be prepared for when the famine comes because there's going to be seven years of plenty before the famine. And so uh, Pharaoh said, can we find anybody to lead in this other than him in whom is the spirit of the gods? And so he uh, assigned the job to Joseph and uh, he uh, gave him his signet ring and also had him ride in the second chariot, dressed him in fine clothes and put a gold chain around his neck. All of those so that people would see that he had been delegated authority under the king. And you know what the king said? Nobody's going to raise a hand or a foot in all of the kingdom without your permission. Delegated authority. And then in Matthew 8, there was a centurion who came to Jesus and said, won't you come and heal my uh, servant? And the religious leader said, he is really worthy because he has built a temple for us. And so when the centurion encountered Jesus, he said, you don't need him. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word, and my, son, my servant will be healed. He said, for I am a man under authority, and I have servants, and I tell them to do this, and they do it. Under authority, to have authority. And then Luke 9, 1, before Jesus sent out the disciples, he called them together, and he gave them power and authority to go out in his name. Power and and the authority from Jesus to do, to use the power to accomplish the things of God. Well, there were seven guys named sons of Sceva. He was a high priest. And they saw what the disciples were doing, and so they thought they'd try it. So they went out and found the, this guy who had a bunch of demons. And uh, they said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches... And uh, so the demon said, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? <laughs> and the spirit in that, those guys, in that guy, grabbed them, beat them up, tore their clothes off, and they went out just in terrible shape because they tried to use power that they did not have authority to use. So we must be under authority to have authority. Now, Jesus gave us a bunch of promises for when we pray. And I'm going to tell you a few of them. It, these are all in John. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Then, another one, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, I found that interesting. And that one, he didn't say if you ask the Father in my name. He said, if you ask me in my name. Now, you know, we've been taught that you pray to the Father in Jesus' name, and we don't pray to Jesus, but it's all right. He'll understand. However, this is Jesus saying, pray to me in my name. I'm not sure how that I know how that works, but I find it interesting. And then the next one, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit will remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give it you. And then, in that day you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, He will give it to you. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy will be made full. full. And then the next one, in that day you will ask in my name. I do not say that I will request of the Father on your behalf. In other words, you can go directly to the Father and ask in my name. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But when it comes to praying to the Father, you can go directly to Him. And now let's turn to Mark 16, 17. Mark 16, 17. 
These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You see that authority. God the Father, to Jesus the Son, to the saints. Not just to the disciples, not just to the apostles, but it says to the saints, the believers, the Christians. That's who we are. We belong to God. And God our Father loves us. And God has provided a way for us because He wants us to live in a... In a actually, I believe it's John that says life and have it more abundantly. Yes. Abundantly. Yes. Abundantly. So I want to just challenge us in our prayers to remember the two main things. And that is number one, the kingdom of God, which is the authority of God. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So He's the King. And the other thing, that we come to the Father in Jesus' name, we pray in Jesus' name, and, and the Bible teaches us that the Father will hear our prayer. So this morning, on the way here, He heard my prayer, and He responded. And it just almost, not quite instantly, but almost, it was gone. And I thought, yeah, Lord, that's good. And so I'm standing here today now, no pain anywhere. Praise God. Now, I would like to call the prayer team to come up and take your places. And uh, for those of you...